Hi, everybody. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of The Shift with Gina. We are back. I'm so happy to be here with you all. Our last episode was with a really fantastic guest, Landon Starbucks. So if you weren't there for the last episode, if you haven't watched it yet, highly recommend, especially if you're a parent who is at all concerned about the content that children are consuming online, and not even just online, but the kind of content that our kids are being bombarded with from our culture. Uh, Landon just made this really incredible film called The War on Children. And it's a great documentary that includes so much information and a lot of great interviews exposing what a lot of kids, a lot of what is being pushed on kids today. And it's a scary thing. And I think as parents, we need to be aware, we need to be armed with information. And even if you're not a parent yet, it's good information to know because there's a lot going on in our culture that's just really frightening. Um, Let's see, today we'll talk about birth control, the birth control misinformation article from Washington Post that came out at this point, probably almost two weeks ago, but there's a lot here that I want to cover. Um, This past couple weeks has just been really busy. I meant to I meant to get in here and film, but um, oh my gosh, I don't even think I mentioned to you guys a couple weeks ago, my daughter got lice. She picked up lice. Never in a million years would I think my daughter would pick up lice. I never got lice as a kid. My mom worked in a school. She worked in a primary school when I, I think when I was in middle school, she went back to work and she would always tell stories about kids that had to go home because they had lice and it's easily transferable from kid to kid. So we discovered my daughter, my two-year-old had lice. It's pretty simple to treat. You just get the medicated shampoo and have to wash the bedding, you know, every couple days or whatever. And of course, that that meant I had it too because she and I are always in close contact, head to head, hugging, rolling around, whatever. So I had lice too. Um, my husband just shaves his head. Usually he usually either has a buzz cut or, or he'll just shave it all off and because it's easier for jujitsu. And so he was fine. But <laughs> he had to spend a lot of time combing our hair and helping me get the stuff out of my hair because I couldn't comb and see by myself. So that was um, that was a thing. It just it, I was amazed at how much time it took. It took a lot of time to just address the lice and wash everything in the house and feel like we were clean again. (laughs) So that happened a couple weeks ago. And we've just been so busy trying to get the house ready for the baby. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. You guys, I think I've got like six or seven weeks left of this pregnancy. And it's going by a lot faster than the first time. But, um, you know, trying to prepare the new room for my daughter, because we're moving my daughter into her new bedroom, and putting the new baby into the nursery. So we have to I just got the wallpaper, we got to wallpaper her room and finish painting and putting together her new bed and mounting the furniture, the dresser on the wall, so it can't come down in case she tries to pull drawers out or climb or whatever. So there's a lot to get done. But We're back. I'm happy to be back with another episode because this topic is particularly important to me. And I'll tell you why, because I'm going to tell more about my own story. And that's going to give you a lot of insight as to why I speak about birth control online a lot. Um, I've gotten a lot of hate for it. Got a lot of women who are angry at me for it. But I, I want to tell my story because I want to prevent women from going through what I went through. But first, let's take a brief look at the Washington Post article that went viral. The title was Women Are Getting Off Birth Control Amid Misinformation Explosion. What a term, misinformation explosion. And just the very first paragraph of this article talks about uh, finding a cascade of misleading videos vilifying hormonal contraception and young women are blaming their are blaming their weight gain on the pill as if they're acting like that's not a real thing it's not a real side effect and then of course right off the bat they they uh, attribute it all to right wing commentators and they even use the term far right far right influencers blaming conservatives for spreading misinformation about the birth control pill or any other hormonal contraception. And that's this is how the article just kicks off. And um, it says physicians and researchers say little data is available about the scale of this new phenomenon. But anecdotally, more patients are coming in with misconceptions about birth control fueled by influencers and conservative commentators. So um, right off the bat, they are politicizing this issue and acting like women who are questioning the birth control, women who are 
disenchanted and disappointment about the side effects of the birth control pill are, um, are, are just a result of some sort of political spectrum of one end of the political spectrum. And if you notice through this whole article, I'm obviously not going to read it all to you. It's really easy to find. All you have to search is Washington Post birth control misinformation. I want you to notice something very important. They never try to disprove the fact that these side effects exist. Not once. It was actually very strange. I interviewed Dr. Poppy Daniels, who was an OBGYN. She's a holistic OBGYN who was also independent, which means she doesn't work for a hospital or um, any any sort of hospital system in the medical care system. She has her own private practice, and that's extremely important because she explains in the many interviews I've done with her in the past that a lot of these OBGYNs, they have to say and push certain things in their practice because they are controlled by the higher ups. But Dr. Poppy, for example, she has an independent practice, so she doesn't have to answer anybody. So she can tell the truth. She can say a lot of uncomfortable things that uh, a lot of other doctors won't say. But she pointed this out to me, too. I did an interview with her yesterday in my women's group about, um, about this topic. And she said, notice how they don't ever disprove the side effects. They don't even address the side effects that a lot of the women are complaining about. Weight gain, gut issues, terrible skin, low sex drive. Um depression, anxiety, suicidal ideations, a lot of these severe mood changes that come from the birth control pill and hormonal contraception. They don't try to disprove that, any of that in the article, none of that. You know, all they do, all they do is complain about people's lacking credentials. You don't have the right two letters behind your name. You're not an MD. You didn't go to medical school, so you can't say anything about the birth control pill and the side effects. They never address the fact that many women are turning away from hormonal contraception because they're suffering from a lot of these side effects that are not listened to by their doctors. Women are gaslit by their doctors. They go in there. I can't tell you how many stories I get every day because I have a women's online health group where we discuss a lot of these issues. I also talk to a lot of women in my DMs on Instagram and Twitter, and I get stories all the time, very disgruntled, disappointed, upset, and understandably angry women who come to me and and tell these stories about how they go to their doctor and they say that the birth control pill is their sure that the pill is causing a lot of these side effects. And doctors ignore them, they don't listen to them, or even worse, they belittle them and they act like they're crazy. So this political hit piece from Washington Post cares more about attacking far right extremists and influencers than actually helping to improve women's health. And it's the same thing as the article from Time Magazine and other articles saying that fitness is now white supremacist. It's rooted in white supremacy and fitness is, is what far right extremists are interested in. This is a, ri- a ridiculous claim to even say that about the pill, right? Because this is all about far right conservative conservatives who are against the pill. The woman who wrote this article must not know about the Nelson hearings, Okay, so the Senate, the first Senate hearings on the birth control pill was led by feminists, by liberal feminists. Okay, the pill came on the market in 1960, and there were a lot of issues with the pill in the beginning, especially because it was a much higher dose. So don't forget, I mean, I've talked about this many times on my show before, and by now you probably know the history of the pill is rooted in eugenics. Um, The abortion industry, Margaret Sanger wrote in many letters that she intended the pill to be used as a eugenic effort to cleanse society of certain people reproducing and to just lower the population in general, which has been a huge globalist agenda for a long time. And the pill was first tested out on uh, people in psychiatric hospitals, women who were in psychiatric hospitals and were not given informed consent. They were just shoved the pill without any idea of what they were taking. And the pill was given to women in Puerto Rico. They went to Puerto Rico because these women lived in poverty. They were uneducated and they wanted to test out the pill on the type of people that they didn't want reproducing. So you have this long history of the pill, right? And you can go watch my other episodes to learn more uh, details about this history. But a lot of feminists were really unhappy with the way that the pill was being handed out to women against their will. And even when it was put on the market in the United States, a lot of women were experiencing severe side effects that were not properly reported. So we don't even really know the true statistics and the true data and the depth to which the pill was affecting women's health, women's fertility. 
So in 1970, in January, experts assembled in this in the Senate chamber and began giving their testimony on the hazards of the pill. Okay, and Alice Wolfson was a member of the member of the radical collective DC Women's Liberation. And she was sitting in the audience listening to experts and her group had come to the hearings because they had all taken the pill at one time or the other and had experienced extreme side effects. The group was outraged that their doctors had never informed them of the risks associated with the pill. And they sat in the chamber and they heard one male witness after another describe serious health risks. And they were furious that there was not a single woman who had taken the pill who was there to testify. These are feminists. Okay, so it was liberal feminists we're talking about. So it's so ridiculous and ironic that now all of a sudden the Washington Post is trying to make this out to be some sort of far right extremist issue. The original women who stepped up to talk about the pill were feminists who wanted to air their grievances on on, on national TV. They wanted these proceedings to be recorded. They wanted the um, they wanted this group to be frequently heard on on nightly news and. An estimated 87% of women between the ages of 21 and 45 followed the hearings. That's a huge number. And 18% of these women stopped taking the pill as a result of these hearings. This is what the feminists did. So if there's one thing we can join in with the feminists back then at least, it's we don't like the pill and we're really, really upset about the dishonesty that is around the pill when it comes to doctors handing it out to women. Okay, so it's just ironic and hilarious and so stupid. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be mean, but so stupid of them to try to frame this as some sort of some sort of far right extremist issue. The fact of the matter is women have been speaking up about the pill for decades and decades, and it's never been about one political spectrum end of the political spectrum versus the other. This is about the fact that women are lied to. They are not given full informed consent about the pill. And on top of that, there is a lot of research showing all of these side effects that we talk about online. The pill causes severe nutrient depletion, especially of things like magnesium, zinc, selenium, B vitamins, vitamin C, a lot of these nutrients that are incredibly important for a woman's functioning body. The pill shuts down the connection between your brain and your ovaries so you don't ovulate. You don't even have a real period on it. You have, yeah, sure, you bleed when you stop taking the pill and start taking the placebo, but when you actually bleed, it's called a withdrawal bleed. It's not a true period. It's not the endometrium lining actually shedding. And we know there's plenty of research showing that the pill makes you attracted to different kind of men because it changes your sex hormones, which changes what kind of men you're attracted to and what kind of pheromones you're attracted to. We know that the pill causes severe gut issues and significantly increases your likelihood of contracting SIBO, leaky gut syndrome, any other irritable bowel syndrome. So when you come off the pill, one of the first things that we recommend is you heal Heal your gut lining and you you replenish your body of all of these nutrients that you've been missing out on. A prenatal multivitamin, by the way, ladies, if you're coming off of the pill, you've got to take a prenatal multivitamin. Doesn't matter if you have any plans for pregnancy today, tomorrow, or in 10 years, or never. A prenatal multivitamin is really important for your childbearing years. I will actually put the link for my prenatal multivitamin that I've been taking for like five years in the link. Make sure it has folate and not folic acid. Folic acid is the synthetic form that does more harm than good and has been tied to tongue ties and children and babies. Um, so even if you're not planning on getting pregnant, though, folic acid is not good for the body. So my pill that I've been taking is folate, not folic acid. And for some reason, it's hard to find prenatal vitamins with folate, folate because folic acid is just cheaper. Anyway, so all of these side effects from the pill have been proven through a lot of research and not to mention the big ones, blood clots, heart attacks, strokes. I'm gonna tell my story soon. I almost died from the birth control pill from a pulmonary embolism. And they say that the data shows that only nine women out of 10,000 will contract blood clots from the birth control pill. In my interview with Dr. Poppy, holistic independent OBGYN, she and I talked about how these numbers are very likely not accurate. Why? Because in order to test 10,000 women and to get a large enough sample of women and see how many of them actually got blood clots from the pill, that takes a lot of money, takes a lot of effort, and it takes a lot of approval that the pharmaceutical industry will not approve of. 
And on top of that, you think about all these women who get blood clots from the pill, how much of it is actually reported when it's entered into the system, when you put the information into the system as a doctor or a nurse, how many of those cases are actually actually say specifically that the blood clots came from hormonal birth control? Because I don't even, I, I doubt mine was because when I first had my pulmonary embolism, it was not. It, it, they were not sure. They didn't come into me and say, hey, it's from it's from hormonal birth control. No, we found out later when I went and did a bunch of testing and found out I had no genetic predispositions. That's when the doctors came to me and they were like, well, I don't think we can really rule out anything else. It's It's got to be hormonal birth control. So these numbers are severely underreported but we know that they exist. And so in this article, they don't even address any of these side effects. They act like women are just crazy and these nutty, hippie, far-right extremist influencers are giving you scary misinformation about the pill, but they don't even have anything to deny these claims because it's all been proven through research and science. Now, in my interview with Dr. Poppy, by the way, I have a women's health group called The Shift. We have a ton of webinars and great information in there about women's health, fertility, hormones, weight loss, nutrition, lifestyle, non-toxic living. And I'm always trying to do interviews with different kinds of experts. And with Dr. Poppy's interview, she talked about how the pill dumbs down doctors. And she says that the pill has made so many OBGYNs averse to asking questions and investigating more information from their patients to try to figure out what the root cause is of their symptoms because it's so much easier and they make more money from just handing out the pill to teens and women and saying, oh, well, this will help you fix everything. But all it does is just put a, a temporary Band-Aid over it and doesn't actually get to the root cause. And so this is why she says the pill dumbs down doctors. So if you want access to this interview and all the other programs we do in my group, click the link in my description and it'll take you to Mighty Networks. You don't need a Facebook account. You don't need any social media account. You just need an email address. Enrollment is open for a few days. I only open enrollment once a month because I want to onboard everybody, make sure I get to talk to you and, and, and you're set up with the group. We got hundreds of women in the group now. We got a ton of stuff like weekly recipes, weekly workouts. We do weight loss programs. We're starting a really fun April health challenge on Monday, April 1st. And it's a bingo challenge. So whoever gets whoever gets picked out of the raffle, the more bingos you get, the more entries you get into the raffle, you get a great prize. So we're working on a lot of stuff in the group and a lot of women have experienced great weight loss and had a lot of help with preparing meals at home and just learning more about nutrition. We just had a girl announce that she just lost 15 pounds. She just hit the 15 pound weight loss mark that she's been working on for a little while. So there's a lot of good stuff happening in the shift. So join us if you're a woman only. Sorry, guys, women only. Anyway, so root cause versus symptom suppression. This is something that Dr. Poppy talked about, and this is why so many doctors are not interested in healing their, their patients, because they get a lot of incentive from just handing out the pill. And this is why the, this birth control topic is particularly important to me, because as I said, I almost died from hormonal, hormonal birth control when I was 19 years old. It was prescribed to me because I had heavy, unmanageable periods. I went to the doctor and I told them that I, I it, it was it was painful every month. It was kind of irregular. It was heavy. I didn't know what to do. And the first thing that she did, I was in college. I was a sophomore, I believe, in college, either a sophomore or a junior. And I went in and she just, okay, listen to me, wrote something down on a pad, handed it to me. She says, I think this form of birth control is going to be great for you. So I didn't go in and ask for birth control because I was sexually active and I wanted to prevent pregnancy. I just went in there and I, I expressed some concerns about a heavy, heavy period that was painful and that really made me not want to go to class every month. And all she did was write on a pad and shove the piece of paper at me and had me go get hormonal birth control from the university pharmacy. And that was it. She did not tell me any of the side effects. She didn't tell me anything that might happen. So as a 19 year old, I mean, you you listen to doctors. We're taught to listen to experts. Today, you know, you fast forward many years later, a lot more women are becoming aware that we should question our doctors. We should advocate for informed consent. But back then, like, you know, doctors had the full God complex and that was that. So I started taking hormonal birth control and six weeks later, I was having the symptoms of a heart attack. I remember waking up, it was a Wednesday morning in my college apartment. I was sharing the apartment with two other girls. 
And I woke up and I sat up in my bed and I was like, oh my gosh, my heart was racing. It felt like it was gonna jump out of my chest. It really felt like I was about to have a heart attack. And I tried to walk to my closet, which was like six feet away from my bed. And I had to sit back down because it felt like I was gonna collapse. And I called my mom, you know, cause I always call my mom if something terrible is happening. I don't know what to do, especially at that age. I call my mom like, mom, I don't know what to do. She's okay, calm down. She says, maybe just go to the student clinic. Okay, get yourself there and they can try to figure out what's going on, but don't panic. So I somehow got myself to the student clinic and they ran an EKG on me and I waited for a little while and the nurse came out. She said, honey, I don't think there's anything really wrong with you. Why don't you just go down and, and, and lie down in your apartment? Just get some rest. It's probably stress. You're probably just experiencing um, you know, a lot of anxiety from what's going on with your education and, and, and your life right now in school. And I said, okay. I said, okay. Still not 100% sure. So I went back to my apartment. I lie down. And a couple hours later, I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize. Something told me to pick it up. I picked it up and it was the doctor from the student clinic. And he said to me, I'm so sorry I wasn't able to see you because we were so busy today, but I just looked at your chart and I looked at your information and I think you need to take yourself to the emergency room because I think you might be having a pulmonary embolism. And I was like, what the fuck? I was like, what? And this was probably almost like six o'clock in the evening at that point, between five to six. And I said, what? He said, just please take yourself to the ER. He said, because I'm not sure, but the worst thing that we can do right now is to wait and then something worse might happen. Okay, so what is a pulmonary embolism? It's when a blood, it's a blood clot that blocks and stops blood flow to an artery in the lung. Right. So a lot of times a blood clot can start in the leg and travel to the lung. Um, so I got to the to the hospital and I had to wait in the ER until about two or three o'clock in the morning. I was just sitting in the waiting room feeling these like sort of heart attack symptoms that would would come back and go away and come and go away. And finally, they called me in. They did um, a CT scan. They ran a couple other tests. And they put, finally put me into a room at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And they told me that I was having a pulmonary embolism and that there were abnormally large blood clots lodged in my lungs. I was 19 years old. Imagine you're in school. You're 19. I was training in the mock trial team. We had a really big tournament coming up that weekend. We were supposed to travel for. I had a lot of things going on in school. It did not compute to me. I was just so confused. I was like, what do you mean I have a pulmonary embolism? I actually asked them. I said, can I go do this mock trial thing and come back on Monday? Because I have a lot to do. And the doctors were like, we obviously can't force you to stay. You can't ever force a patient to stay in the hospital. But we're going to strongly suggest that you stay here because if you had come in 12 hours later, that blood clot would have traveled to your lungs. I'm sorry, to your heart or to your brain and caused a, a fatal heart attack or stroke. And this is something that I learned later is that the younger that you have a heart attack, the more likely you are that you will die from it because the the heart creates more blood vessels as you get older. And so that's why you hear those horror stories of like a 35 year old male who has a heart attack at the gym and he just dies. And so they were telling me that if I had come in much later, those blood clots would have traveled to my heart or my brain and I would have been dead. And I was like, okay, so maybe it's time to call my parents and tell them that I am being admitted into the hospital. So I called my mom at like four o'clock in the morning and they were, you know, as calm as they can be. My mom is really good in, in a crisis. So my parents lived four hours away. They drove up right away. And it's so crazy. My childhood dog, my parents didn't tell me this until weeks later, but my childhood dog was found dead that night the night that I was admitted into the hospital, my childhood dog that I loved. And I told my parents, I said, listen, I said, if, if, if she dies when I'm in school, don't tell me until I come home because I won't be able to handle it. And so they weren't planning to tell me anyway, but it was the same night I was admitted into the hospital that my dog died. So my parents drove up four hours and I was admitted into the hospital and there was no surgery or anything that could be done. It's really just putting you on blood thinners and, and really monitoring you and, and being put on bed rest. And I had to give myself shots of the blood thinner every day, twice a day for a little while. I was in the hospital for not that long, two or three days. And I had to cancel pretty much everything. My life was, my life stopped. 
but I was really grateful to be alive. I was really lucky to be alive. So I went back to my apartment. My mom had to stay for about two weeks because I could I wasn't really able to to walk around. I had to be on bed rest. They had to give me shots twice a day, the blood thinning shots to make sure that the clots would essentially pass. Um, and that's what happened to me when I was 19. After that, a couple weeks after I sort of was back on my feet, I went to see a hematologist and they took like 17 tubes of my blood and they tried to figure out what on earth could have caused a pulmonary embolism in a young, healthy 19 year old. They found zero genetic predispositions, no blood clotting issues in, in, in my blood or in, in my family history, whatever. And the doctor looked at me, I'll never forget. He was like this older Irish guy and he said that, he said, I cannot understand. There's no other explanation that this would happen to a healthy 19 year old other than hormonal birth control. And I was like, well, that's great. Okay. And it's one of those things where you think that birth control, it might cause some side effects temporarily and that's it. And it's not going to affect your future. Yeah. That's not how it works. It affected the rest of my life. And I'll tell you how. So I didn't realize this. The doctor mentioned this to me. I can kind of vaguely remember. He said, you can go about living your life. You're going to have to take blood thinning medication for a few months just to make sure that you're okay. He says, unfortunately, when you have one pulmonary embolism, you're much more prone to having them in the future. It's just how it works. And he said, when you get pregnant, if you want to get pregnant one day, you're going to have to be really careful because you're going to be classified as a high-risk pregnancy because the the chances for blood clotting during pregnancy are much higher in general, especially if you have had a pulmonary embolism in the past, if you have a history of a PE. And I was like, okay, I was 19 at the time. I wasn't thinking about pregnancy or even marriage at that point. I was still in school. I had to finish college. I wasn't planning on that. So I just went about my life. And when I first got pregnant with my husband, I went to the doctor and I was like, okay, we're going to just, we're going to have a, a normal pregnancy. And uh, I got my first ultrasound and they told me that I had to give myself blood thinning shots every single night for the rest of my pregnancy and for six weeks after the birth, six weeks postpartum. And this doesn't sound like a big deal. And like, it's not a big deal today. I take those blood shots, those bl blood thinning shots now every night during my pregnancy. But at the time I cried, I was so upset because I was terrified of needles. I'm not good at giving myself shots. Like I'm just not, I'm a baby when it comes to needles. And it just, it, it's really jarring to hear something like that because you realize that you're a high risk pregnancy, you know, and all the doctors were suddenly hovering over me because there's this huge risk. Because if you have blood clots, pulmonary embolism during your pregnancy, it's basically an instant miscarriage. So doctors will do everything they can to make sure that that doesn't happen because they obviously also don't want that on their conscious or on their record. So you're automatically a high risk pregnancy. And that means that not only do I have to see a general OB, but I have to see an MFM OB, a specialist OB. MFM is maternal fetal medicine. And I have to see both of these doctors back and forth, right? And the MFM OB is just making sure that risk is mitigated and they're making suggestions to my general OB about birth. And, you know, normally a woman who wants to give birth without medical interventions would opt in for a home birth, right? And that's something that I would have definitely considered, but I am not, I'm essentially not eligible for that. Like I talked to midwives there's basically no midwife that will deliver me at home because of the risk, because of my PE history. So because of taking hormonal birth control and nearly dying from it when I was 19 years old, I'm not able to have the kind of pregnancy and birth that I always dreamed of having. These are the long-term consequences that come from taking hormonal birth control that more women really need to hear about. And I'm sick and tired of having experts and these uh, political hit pieces from these hack journalists trying to silence women like me who have had these experiences and simply want to share them to warn younger women of what could potentially happen when you take hormonal birth control blindly. And I get so many stories from a lot of other women who also almost died from birth control. And as a result, their future pregnancies and births were not what they wanted them to be because they were high risk because they were not able to do a home birth. They're not able to find a midwife who can do that kind of high risk home birth. So this is why this birth control topic is particularly personal to me. And I'm never going to stop talking about it. And I'm sick and tired of seeing women silenced. 
And women need to know. I'm not saying this to scare young women into thinking that you're going to die from the birth control pill. But I want you to know what is at stake here and what is not being told to you by doctors. Because I, I was part of a lawsuit after that. I sued. I sued over the pulmonary embolism and I won. I didn't. I barely got anything from it. But you know, I was in the middle of a lawsuit. I don't want any other woman to have to go through that. But that's because the doctors were not upfront with me about the risks. And it's time that women knew the truth and women who share information about the pill, they're silenced and gaslit because they don't have the right credentials. The fact that this article was published by the Washington Post means that they're scared. This is what Dr. Poppy said to me in our interview yesterday, too. She said, this means they're scared. She says the fact that they're taking the time to write this hit piece and go after these influencers and and try to make uh, these people sound like far right extremists. She says it means that we are gaining ground and it means that they are scared about the fact that so many women are listening to these stories and they're scared that so many women are finding alternative care because their doctors are not giving them the care and the answers that they are looking for. And it it's, it's really sad when you think about the fact that the pill has been hailed as one of the most empowering things given to women. Here, you can have as much sex as you want and you're not gonna have a baby. You don't have to have kids ever if you want. At the very least, you can delay having kids for five to 10 years. Oh, you can also delay marriage. There's no reason to get married and have kids anytime soon. This mitigates the risk. It's a tool that's used to devalue sex and intimacy. It's a tool used to... Uh, to to lessen women's health and to make them believe that the most empowering thing that they can do is to just have sex randomly with men and participate in hook, hookup culture. And even worse than that, I think, well, just as bad, I don't know if it's worse, but the pill is hailed as the only solution to pregnancy prevention, PCOS, endometriosis. They say it's the end all be all. The reality is, and this is the hard reality that many experts and pharmaceutical companies in the conventional medical system don't want you to know, there are other options. There are other alternatives to treating things like PCOS and endometriosis. Dr. Poppy, the OBGYN that I just interviewed, she lays them out in this interview that I did with her. She wants women to know that there are options out there. You do not have to go to the pill to manage your endometriosis symptoms. You do not have to go to the pill to manage PCOS. In fact, she says that the pill is known to worsen PCOS symptoms. And women do not need a group one carcinogen that is full of synthetic hormones in order to treat the root cause of what is happening with their their menstrual cycle. And I wish more women knew this because this is not your only option. You And I get this all the time. Every time I talk about the pill, I get women who are like, yeah, but you don't know what it's like to have endometriosis. It's my only option. And I'm like, I want you to heal your endometriosis. I want you to heal your PCOS. I want you to know that the pill is not the only option to do that. In fact, it's not even an option for healing. All it does is mask your symptoms temporarily. One day you're gonna have to come off the pill. When you come off the pill, your symptoms are gonna be the same, if not worse. So the pill has been sold to us and packaged as this pretty little lie. Empowerment for hookup culture and as much sex as you want the only solution for pregnancy prevention, PCOS, endometriosis. And now you have an entire generation of women who have been convinced that this is the only way to approach their menstrual issues and their gynecological problems. And this is why they're so scared because we present them with something different. We finally present them with an alternative and you do not have to be an MD. You do not have to have a medical degree to talk about the side effects of the pill. And this is why I want every woman to understand who's listening to this. If I can do it, so can you. If I can struggle with painful, heavy periods, be prescribed hormonal birth control, have a pulmonary embolism at 19 and almost die from it and yet survive and transform my lifestyle and my health to have very easy, manageable periods and go on to have healthy children. If I can do all that, you can do that and more. And you don't have to go through everything that I went through. And this is why I always just boil it down to if you struggle with painful, heavy periods, and if you think that the only way to manage that is to take the birth control pill, 
let me show you a different way and let many other women and many other experts show you that there are alternatives. Because if I can do this, if I can write my own story of menstrual health and fertility without relying on pharmaceuticals, even after a pharmaceutical almost killed me and took my life when I was a teenager, if I can come back from that, that means you can also write your own story of menstrual health and fertility. You know, these predatory companies want nothing more than you to be chronically sick while you line their pockets. That's the hard truth. A lot of these pharmaceutical companies, they, they don't care about your health. They want, they want you to be unhealthy. You are a money bag to them when you're sick and chronically unwell. And a lot of these experts and doctors, they're in the pockets of big pharma too. So you need to understand this. And I want more women to know that you don't have to go through the pain and suffering that I went through. You can rewrite a better story for yourself. And that starts by, it starts with a lot of things. Women say to me, they're like, I eat healthy and I work out and I still have painful periods. That's just a start. There's so much more to your hormonal health than just eating well and working out. What are you doing for stress management? What are you doing for your mental and your spiritual wellness? What are you doing to eliminate endocrine disruptors in your life that you're consuming and putting on your body and eating every single day? How much sunlight are you getting a day? What kind of sleep are you getting? There are so many things that to, the, the, to consider when it comes to healing our menstrual cycle and healing our hormones. So it's not only eat well and work out. That's a big part of it. I want you to eat a healthy diet. I want you to balance your blood sugar. I want you to to not have insulin resistance. I want you to move your body often. I also want you to go outside and get sunshine. I want you to heal the relationships in your life because you'd be shocked, ladies, at how much stress significantly affects your menstrual cycle and your hormonal balance. Stress plays a huge role in your production of, of progesterone, for example. The more stressed you are, the more depleted you are of progesterone. I want you to understand that the boss girl fast paced corporate life that stresses you out and only allows you to sleep four hours a night, that's affecting your hormonal health too. And I used to have that lifestyle. I used to do that. You know, I used to think that that was the way. And I also want you to know that you have to stop using all of these endocrine disruptors, even down to what kind of water you're drinking. Do you drink tap water? Stop drinking tap water, get install a water filter in your home, reverse osmosis and remineralization so that you are consuming healthy, clean water every day. Get rid of all of those endocrine disruptors and all the nasty products that you use with all the fragrances, whether it's for your hair, your skin, or, or your home. Try to wear clothes that are 100% cotton or linen. Try, try to resist polyester. All of these things. We talk about all of this stuff in my women's group. And by the way, if you're looking for good skincare that's not going to give you major endocrine disruptors, Charlie Skincare is a great option. Link in my bio to get 20% off by using my code Gina, G-I-N-A. I really like this revitalizing daily moisturizer. I use it in the morning before I put on makeup if I need to wear makeup that day. There's a good facial cleanser. The whole line is really great and it comes in Italian glass, which is really important because you're not putting your products in endocrine disrupting plastics. Um, it's a great line. So you got to be more conscious about what you're using in your everyday life too. It's not only about diet and exercise, but you can do it. Ladies, you can take care of yourselves. Join the shift link in the description. We talk about a lot of these issues. I'm here to help you because I want young women to have a different fate than I had. I made a mistake when I was 19. I was not fully informed. I was not educated enough. I didn't know what I was doing. I said yes to a hormonal birth control that nearly took my life and significantly affected my future pregnancies and births. It's, it's, it's what happened. It's what it is. And let me tell you something. It's so, it was so easy for me to be angry. I was so angry for years, years. I was furious. I was so angry that it had to happen to me. Out of all the women that it had to happen to, why did it have to happen to me? I don't know what the answer is. I'm sure God's going to have an answer for me one day. But it was a horrific thing to go through that I would never want, et, uh, never want to wish on anybody. And don't you think I wish I could have the type of pregnancies and births that I, I wanted to have. But because of what happened to me when I was 19, my future looked a little bit different than what I thought it would be. And that's okay. I Trust me, I've spent many years coming to terms with, with, with what it turned out to be. And that's okay. But I just want women to know that you do not have to go through what I went through. And I wish something better for all young women out there because there is something so much better than the horrible fate that I and thousands and thousands of other women have faced.
So take care of yourselves and don't listen to this nonsense. Washington Post sucks. They suck. And if you need help finding a holistic OBGYN, someone who is going to help you answer questions and get to the root cause, I have a couple of websites for you that I'm going to tell you right now because Dr. Poppy in our interview suggested fertilitycare.org, which is um, a website for you to find uh, healthy alternatives for OBGYMs who are going to listen to you and help you find the root cause, not symptom suppression, fertilitycare.org. And if you are looking for hormone testing, because she works with a lot of women who need to get hormone testing because they don't know what's going on with their cycle, you can go to zrtlab.com. They do a lot of great hormone testing. Um, and I think there was another website. I'll share it if I remember it, but take care of yourselves and find a different provider. If your provider is not listening to you and hearing your concerns. Okay. That's all I got for today. I hope you guys have a really great Easter Orthodox Easter this year isn't until May 5th. But for those of you who are observing Easter, um, on this Sunday, um, I hope you have or had, depending on when this episode is released, a really great holiday. Christ is risen. I wish you all the best and we'll see you next time. Bye.